And today we are going to talk about machine learning and artificial intelligence, and it's a particular topic about machine learning algorithms. Um, nowadays, it's a quite a popular topic. Uh, everyone talks about machine learning and artificial intelligence. Everyone knows such things as ChatGPT, as Google Search, as Google Maps. Um, even in my bubble, a lot of people are actually terrified of machine learning and what it its future possibilities and what it could do to us, but I always respond to those kind of uh, statements that it's nothing more, nothing less than just a bunch of really smart algorithms. Uh, sometimes those algorithms could be like, I don't know, uh, hard to say stupidly simple, like, I don't know, you can uh, program your robot to do some simple task like response to some traffic lights, for example, you teach your robot to if he, he saw like you no know, red light, he does stay still and do nothing. If he sees like yellow light, he does launch in the it system and engines and prepare to to move forward. And he when he uh, like sees the green light, he does start in moving forward. This small robotic system system already can be called an AI, which is fascinating. Uh, here I provided some uh, well-known companies uh, who pretty much, I guess, everyone knows it. And all those companies are using uh, machine learning to customize and improve their custom customer's experience. So I don't know, for example, Netflix, Netflix suggests us some best suited uh, films or TV shows to watch. Google uh, helps us to search data through, I don't know, a really big database. Uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, so starting from this point, we could move to what actually, what types of machine learning algorithms there are. So if you look, search through the internet, you could find up to, I don't know, even 10 different uh, machine learning algorithm, algorithms types, uh, but uh, it's all subjectual opinion of the author. And if, if it were up to me, I would just divide it into three big categories. It's supervised, unsupervised, uh, and reinforcement learning. Uh, basically, what those types are, uh, for example, supervised learning, it's the kind of learning where we ourselves are in the role of teacher to our machine learning model. So we basically talk to our model like to a little kid and I don't know, po pointing the fingers to different pictures and saying this picture is a cat. And those that picture is a dog, that picture is a horse, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we basically mark all those pictures to our machine learning model and saying, please look at those pictures, try remember them. We could, I could show you some more pictures of those animals and just try to basically um, distinguish those animals on some new pictures that I will show you. And that will be supervised learning. Uh, Besides all these algorithms that I uh, uh, st stated here, like linear regression, I don't know, KNN classification, random forest, and et cetera, I could also place here a deep learning, uh, machine learning type, which is neural networks. Uh, but this is a more high level and complicated stuff and would not be the topic of today's discussion. Um, then unsupervised learning, it's obviously opposite to supervised learning, but in real life, it's not always possible to explain uh, to our machine learning model what actually to do with those data we provided. So in, in this situation, we basically throw in our machine learning model into swimming pool and just saying, try to swim on your own. So try to figure it out what to do with those data. Um, Classical example would be clustering problem. Basically, we here we have, I don't know, maybe a bunch of different balls of different colors, or maybe, I don't know, 100 different colors. And we are saying to our model to classify those balls into just three categories. And our model has to find the most efficient way to classify. Uh, then reinforcement learning is the kind of learning where we have some, I don't know, environment uh, usually it's a uh, game environment or could be robotic systems. For example, we have a game of chess. Uh, there's a board, there's pieces. We know how those pieces move. Uh, so we have environment, we have some particular states of, in that environment. So we, we, each time we move a piece on the board, we basically, the state of the environment changes. And 
our model knows how to move the pieces and be, it's trained to move, move those pieces the most efficiently. So we provided some kind of reward uh, for each move and our model tried to just maximize those rewards. Um, so this is just ba some basically uh, some basic explanation of those types. And now we could move forward to an actual algorithms. So the first one would be linear regression. It's the most basic algorithm in computer science uh, that helps us to predict a lot of different types of data. For example, we can predict some diseases uh, based on some medical properties of some particular uh, person. Uh, we could predict stock market prices. We could predict, I don't know, housing prices, anything basically that has some bunch of features. When I was preparing for this presentation, I found a really fascinating example of real life linear regression is basically when we explaining to a little kid uh, how to, we basically ask a little kid to sort a bunch of people uh, in ascending order according to their weights. So the little kid doesn't know the actual value of the, of the those people's weight but kid can look into uh, could like uh, assess those people by looking on them so that that man is a bigger one that man is a slimmer one and taller etc etc and based on those characteristics we can like sort those uh, those people um and that's basically how regression works uh so in more uh, efficient way we could say that we have some a bunch of data points on some coordinate plane. It could be two-dimensional, three-dimensional, and how, how, however more dimensional. Uh, so here we have, I don't know, a small uh, visualization. There is a bunch of data points. We have like X and Y uh, rays, and we are just trying to provide the most in the most efficient way straight lines through all those data points. And that would be our line regression and our future predictions. So, for example, if you had uh, some new data points, um, some new data, we would just uh, predict uh, the future outcome based on this regression line. Um, so let's uh, look how actually those algorithm works. So basically, what we are trying to do here is to minimize this uh, error uh, between all those data points here uh, in, in correspondence to our regression line. So we're basically trying to provide, to, to draw this line in the most efficient way. So these errors for each data point would be minimal. Uh, I guess anyone who studied math at school, so pretty much basically anyone knows how the equation of the straight line looks like. And this is here it is. So basically y equals b plus mx. And this is a linear regression formula. Uh, initially, we always have some uh, data to learn on. So to train our model based on this formula, we already know the y's and x's values. And we just need to find uh, this b and m properties of the line. So basically M is uh, a slope of the line. So basically it represents the angle uh, of the other, of other line uh, in correspondence to our X, um, uh, X ray. And B is represented of how high we place our line uh, below zero point in our coordinate plane. So, uh, how to here are, uh, here are provided some formulas of how to find those properties. Um, it looks it might look scary, but basically, what we how, how do how they are they were received? We basically provide we have like some initial y's value and access value. We provide them into this formula, and then, and we receive a bunch of different uh, linear equations where b and m is unknown. And we're just trying to solve this system of equations for B and M. And then we will receive this formula. Uh, to be to put it more simple, let's try to calculate uh, th th these values for some simple data. So here we have data set that represents of uh, students' performance based on their hours of study. So 
if uh, some student studies one for one hour, it receives a score of 11, studies eight hours, receives scores of 18. Um, basically, what we are doing here is, is basically uh, putting all those values into this formula. So we are calculating x squared, x uh, multiplied by y. We are calculating the sum uh, of those values and just putting it into the formula. So for those who don't know, this epsilon, big epsilon sign is basically represent the sum of x's and y's. Uh, so basically that is it. Once we like uh, uh, calculated the sum of those values, we just uh, find this B and M and uh, re replace those values in our regression line formula. And we receive the line like that. Uh, then if we receive some new data, some new hours of some new students, we could predict how high score that student would get. Uh, based on that uh, hours of study. Uh, now a bit more complicated example, uh, because not always uh, in real life, we just will have one independent variable of X. Usually uh, objects in real life are more complicated than that. So for example, we talked about predicting the weight of some person. So we could look into how high that person is, how tall the how tall how tall that person is, how big that person is, and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So there's a big uh, amount of different features we could take a look at. So here we are uh, looking into multiple linear regression, and it works in pretty much a similar way, uh, except we have like uh, a bit bigger formula here. Uh, so we have a bit uh, more. Uh, a, a bit more of these uh, uh, segments here. So we have not just M and B, we have uh, beta zero, beta one, beta two, etc. And we are trying as well in the first case scenario to solve the system of linear record, uh, equations, which looks like uh, could be represented in this matrices form. Uh, so here we have the vector of Y's and the matrix of X's. Uh, multiplied by by beta uh, vector. And here, based on this, it could be uh, replaced with system of linear equations and we're just solving this system. Um, I will not go deep in, in dark, deep forest of uh, higher mass, but here is the basic formula how to solve this system. It is basically matrix operations. Um, not sure if it makes sense to uh, to spend a lot of time explaining it, but uh, just quick work, work, work through. So X uh, with this comma at the top is basically transpose uh, matrix. For example, here we have matrix of axes uh, 1, 1, 1, 1, and X1, X2, Xn. So transposed matrix would be like matrix where our rows and columns are switched. So instead of rows, we have columns and instead of columns, we have rows. And here we have like multiply those matrices. So transpose to an actual matrix, sorry. And we take like um, inverse matrix of that. So the inverse matrix uh, of the, is the matrix multiplied by which we receive the number one uh, and here we have like multiplication of, uh, again, transpose matrix of axis and vector of y's here. Uh, okay, maybe it's not that clear, but we are not studying math here. So let's look into some actual example how that works. I have a little bit of code here. Uh, so uh, I have found the small, uh, a small data set in the Kaggle that represents student, student marks. It looks like that. So we have student marks uh, and have number of courses each student, uh, the student takes and number of hours of study per, per week uh, of, of some particular student. And based on these two properties, we're basically trying to predict the student's mark. So we have labels. We have two properties and we have labeled those properties and let's try to predict them. 
uh, how that would look like. So here, uh, first of all, small remarks, this quote is not pretty, I know, but uh, the main goal is to show the regression line and not the perfect quote. So I think you will for forgive me for that. Um, so what we are doing, so here we basically just uh, load in this, uh, our data set uh, into the matrix. Uh, we have matrix of features. Our features is uh, these two columns. So number of courses and time of study uh, and labels. Uh, labels are the vector of marks. And then we are trying to divide our the initial data set into two categories, the data set for training uh, our regression model. So, okay, we need to find coefficients with this data and uh, the set for testing our model. So uh, this, this data would not be known uh, for, for our model and our model will try to make predictions based on this data. So 80% of our initial data set would be for training and 20% of our data set would be for testing. Uh, so how our linear regression formula looks like. And uh, basically it's uh, the one that I have provided you in the presentation. So we basically transfor uh, transforming uh, our matrix of features, aka access, and just trying to solve our linear uh, system of linear equations uh, for this data. Um, that's basically all you need to know. We're not going to go deep into math problems, but just uh, like substitu substituting the formula uh, that are known. And uh, okay, this formula return us the vector of uh, our coefficients. Okay, from the uh, uh, vector of our coefficients would be this beta zero, beta one, so B vector. Uh, and let's take a look how it goes. So we basically put in our features data set and labor data set into our linear regression and receiving our coefficients. So at this point, we know, uh, we know uh, this beta coefficients. And with the help of these beta coefficients, we, we are trying to make a prediction for some unknown values. So once we have these beta coefficients, we are trying, we are using this formula uh, where we don't know the X values and Y values. So here we are making the prediction. So basically test features, again, is our test data set that our model does not know. And we are just multiplying our coefficients to each of those test features. And that would be our prediction. Um, yeah, so basically here, based on this prediction, it would be uh, hard to display all of those predictions because there are too many of them. So I just uh, displaying the average error in the mark assessment uh, of our model. So basically our error, average error is an absolute uh, is difference between our prediction and uh, between actual mark that student received. And that would be our error. Uh, we are just uh, like summing up all those uh, marks and dividing by their number. Uh, so here we received our beta coefficients. Uh, there those how they, they look like an average error uh of predicting the mark of the student is up to three points so basically the minimum point the student can receive is zero the maximum point is 60. so uh the error of three points is not that big and i think we made a pretty good uh, prediction here um that is basically all about linear regression uh if you uh, have any questions we could like stop here for a bit or we could move forward looks like no question um, okay so we are moving forward uh, basically a bit of assumptions of linear regression so of course it's not perfect and our data are not always could be fit into straight line so we basically need to make sure that our data points are uh, 
uh, have like linear relationship. Usually it is done by uh, just visually analyzing the uh, data plot. So we are just, for example, like we had here, we displayed our data points and we are just looking that it might look like a linear, linear regression. So we they are go in a strict line. So that is one way of assessing that. Uh, also very important step is that our data would not be dependent on each other. So for example, if uh, we have like this, a couple of different features like number of courses and time of study. So uh, we obviously know that number of courses does not directly affect the time of study. So students uh, may, uh, Perform, may do their time management uh, the way they want to. But if those two fields would be like uh, codependent, our prediction would not be that great. So our predictions would f fall down to a, to a much bigger error here. Uh, next thing that is important to know uh, that our uh, each particular particular data point should be independent as well. So we are not here just talking about uh, the features of the data point, but we are talking about each data in our data set uh, separately. So those data should not be uh, dependent on, it, uh, on, it, on each other as well. So yeah, because uh, again, obviously our error would be bigger. Uh, there's a bit of more assumptions there, but those are the most basic ones and the most important, uh, as on my opinion, here. So at this point, that was the most complicated stuff uh, I was going to show you. So we have uh, run through them, so congratulations. Now, it's a bit simpler way and a bit more familiar way for most of the IT guys. Uh, it's just an algorithm. Uh, so classification problem, first of all, what is classification problem? There's actually, we are, we have talked today about clustering problem in the, the, the whole beginning of the presentation, uh, but classification problem is a bit more, is, is a bit different. So, uh, here we have again, a bunch of different balls, uh, of different colors and I don't know, we have group of uh, red balls, we have group of uh, orange balls and group of uh, blue balls. And now we have some new ball that is not in this group. So we are just trying to figure it out to which group this ball should go. So if it's a blue, uh, if it's a blue ball, we should put in, in the blue class and etc. cetera. Um, so how do we do that? Uh, the algorithm is pretty simple. Uh, KNN stands for Kanye's neighbors. So we basically, if we have some bunch of data points, uh, like, like here, we are just, uh, and we have some new data points, like we displayed in this animation. We are just trying from each of those new data points, find the distance uh, to all the other data points in our data set. And then we are just selecting five, the most uh, closest to us data points. So here the algorithm weighs in this way. So we're just selecting the optimum value of K. So uh, we are just need to decide how many nearest neighbors we want to count. Uh, it's usually done in uh, in the method of uh, tries and failures, and there is not a lot of advices here. Uh, there is a small tips that we will talk later. Uh, then we calculated the distance from our new data point to each of, of the other data points. We are finding our five nearest neighbors here, like is displayed on the animation. So, for example, the first data point is blue one and all its neighbors are blue. So obviously we should put this, uh, this uh, data point into blue category. Um, yeah, so basically this is the voting mechanism for classification. As well, we could take like uh, regression uh, of this. So we basically are making an average 
coordinate of all its neighbors. It is usually useful when we need to find some new classes in regression tasks, but we will just for now stop on classification problem. Uh, so how do we actually how do we actually know how many neighbors we should take into the account? It's basically the most important step uh, at this point. Um, usually, as I already said, it's based on uh, like some doing some uh, experiments on the data point uh, and trying to look visually. Once we have like a lot of uh, uh, data that are not similar and that are spread over uh, the our coordinate system so we should use like a bigger number of k neighbors uh, usually it's also a good idea to use like an odd value for k just because uh, for example here we have five nearest neighbors and we, if we would definitely not get the situation well we have like three neighbors from red uh, class and three neighbors from blue class and we would not know what to do in this situation. So basically, it's usually better to use an odd number of neighbors uh, in the algorithm. Um, also, we could use cross-validation methods. Uh, basically, this cross-validation method, what this is what we've done for in our code for linear regression. So where it is, so splitting our data set on train and test uh, like uh, subsets is basically called cross-validation. And this helps us to basically uh, take a general look into our data and how our machine learning model would perform uh, for unknown data. Um, again, how do we basically calculate the distance uh, from our data point to all the others. It strictly depends on the, uh, on, the on our problem. Usually it's, uh, you, we, you, we are using the, the Euclidean distance. So basically finding the direct, uh, the direct distance between two data points in coordinate system. But there is obviously a lot uh, more, uh, a lot more more complicated uh, formulas like here, um, so this, this formulas are more gener generalized of this formula and we are again, uh, trying to make some experiments with which formula our data would fit better. So unlike all the other algorithms in programming, like BFS or DFS on graphs or et cetera. Uh, the machine learning algorithms are usually relying on some experimental uh, way of uh, doing things. So not all of the problems from real life could be solved with one really simple algorithm. So here we should know, we should try different formula, for, formulas for our data and uh, see what formula looks better uh, here. Uh, pros and cons of uh, Kanier's neighbor, neighbor's algorithms. Well, basically it's pretty easy to implement. So algorithm is consists of four simple steps. Uh, it adapts easily. So we could perform this algorithm on different variety of data. We could perform it on images, extract some uh, key features from the image and basically distinguish some animals from those features based on this algorithm. Uh, then it has very few hyperparameters. So basically the only hyperparameter our algorithm has is the number of neighbors uh, in the algorithm. And this is all we need to figure it out. Uh, as well, we could like try different formulas, but it's not considered like a hyperparameter at this point. Uh, disadvantages uh, of this algorithm is basically once we have like a big number of data points, so we are not talking here about hundreds, we are talking here about millions or more. So it would be really time consuming to calculate the distances to each data point in our data set. And yeah, it would, with a big number of data points, it would take ages here. 
so that is the biggest disadvantage of this algorithm. Uh, basically, a curse of dimensionality means that if we have our not two dimensional data points, but we might have like, you know, fifth, five, uh, I don't know, 10, 100 dimensions. And with that dimension increase, our algorithm becomes more unreliable. Uh, prone to overfitting. Basically, prone to overfitting is uh, related to our problems of uh, selecting the best K for our algorithm. So if we select um, too small number of nearest neighbors, we might overlook some bigger scale uh, neighbors. So our nearest neighbors, for example, five, five nearest neighbors might really mean that our first data point would be blue. But if you take about 10 nearest neighbors, it we might seem that most of our uh, neighbors are red. So this is the biggest problem and it's called overfitting uh, in this problem. Um, basically, this is it for uh, car nearest neighbors algorithm. Uh, let me know if we could move forward. Oh yeah, we have one more slide. Uh, yeah, a lot, um, probably you would ask me, does anyone use this kind of algorithm? And where, it, where does it use? Um, so, Actually, yes, that's used, that is used a lot. It's very popular algorithm. It is used in pattern recognition, as I already mentioned, we could, I don't know, distinguish different patterns for different animals on the photos. We could spot some patterns for client purchases, purchasing habits, which is used, for example, in Amazon uh, to uh, find out what products we would buy faster. Uh, it is used a lot in rec recommendation systems. I'm not sure if it is used in such system as Spotify or Apple Music, but it definitely could be used for uh, suggesting some new music tracks for us. It is used in computer vision, in medical field, uh, and a lot, um, and uh, a lot of others different spheres of human activity. Um, Yep. Any questions at this point? Well, I guess no. Uh, then we have another problem of machine learning, which is called clustering. Uh, so before this, we were talking about classification problem. Uh, so classification problem required us uh, to know the labels of some data points. So we know that this is a bunch of data points are of class, uh, I don't know, red and bunch of data points are of class uh, like blue. But in clustering, we just have the bunch of data points and we don't know what class they are. So the problem of this algorithm is basically to figure it out and to divide those data points into, into different classes. Uh, here as well in the, in, is an, uh, on the previous algorithm, we need to basically se select our hyperparameter K, which means how many classes uh, we need to have uh, on how many classes we need to divide our data points. So basically here on the picture, we have just two classes. So it, it is visual visually, uh, nice to understand. And so visually we could basically come to a point. So we need just two classes for our algorithm. Um, yeah, so let's see how the algorithm works itself. Um, here, algorithm is pretty simple. So we have a bunch of different data points. And for example, we have, we need to have three different classes and to divide those data points into three different classes. What do we do? We are using some such, such a thing as centroids for the classes. So basically each centroid is a point on our coordinate system, which represents the center of our class. And this center um, would catch all the nearest data points to itself. 
So basically, each data point would would see that oh, I'm the closest to a uh, like green center, so I would be green. Or another data point would say oh, I, I'm the closest to the blue center, so I will be blue. And that is like the main idea of chi means. So basically, at the first stage, we are just selecting the initial uh, number of our classes, so it it would be three. Then we are just uh, picking up some centroids. Usually it is doing randomly from the data points in the in our data set. So here we have like a hundred different points. So we are just selecting randomly three points and that would be our first centroids. Then we are just calculating from each data point, which centroid would be the nearest to us. And then this data point would be associated with this centroid and with this class. Uh, on the next stage, we just uh, like uh, doing, we are just calculating the average coordinate through all those data points to calculate the new centroid. And after this, uh, after this step, we just basically repeat steps from one to three. Uh, till we don't have any changes in centroids or the changes are too, are too small. So let's see on a bit uh, small example here. So here we have like a bunch of different points. From those different points, we just randomly selected a three centroids. So it is located here. As you could see, even visually, it is not the most efficient way of classifying those data points, but at this, at this uh, stage, it does not really matter. So we basically just look in, uh, going through each data point and, and looking what centroid is the nearest to us. So basically here we can see that this data point is associated with this centroid, this data point is associated with green centroid and et cetera. Because uh, these centroids are the nearest to them. On the next stage, we are just taking the coordinates of all those data points and we are making an average coordinate between all of them. And that would be our next centroid. So as we could see here, we just received our next centroid and we recalculated uh, again uh, with which centroid our data points are associated. So again, we are just repeating moves. We just calculating the nearest centroid to each particular data point. Then we are again making an average uh, centroid and again recalculated data points. And again and again, until we don't have like any change in centroid movements here. And that would be our like final result uh, for clustering uh, of the data. So basically, uh, what we have here, advantages and disadvantages of this algorithm. Well, I, as you could see, it's pretty easy to implement. So we don't do any complicated stuff here. We just looking, uh, we just going with brute force through each data point and uh, calculating the nearest centroid. So with any distance formula we want. Uh, there's no parameters here except this K parameter, which is uh, number of clusters, but it's not really a hyperparameter because uh, we are the one who decides how many clusters we want. Uh, then, uh, again, as in Ka near, nearest neighbor al algorithm, we could you apply this uh, algorithm to a different uh, data types. We could apply it to images. For example, uh, we could uh, if, if the image is too big of a size, it has too many colors, we could reduce number of colors uh, to them. For example, if we put, we, we have, if we imagine this, all these data points are just uh, pixels of the image, we could just find, I don't know, three centroids to all these data points. And those three, our three, three centroids would be our new colors uh, for the image. And so we could optimize our image by ha to having just three colors uh, and not like a million one. Uh, so that is one thing. 
uh, of, cor of course, here we don't have like any training phase. So as in linear regression, we had to provide some testing data uh, and training data to our model, but in coming, there is no such purpose here. And it's kind of um, makes our algorithm run faster. Then uh, disadvantages would be computational complexity. Of course, if you have like a really big number for data points, it would be hard to brute force all of them and to find, and to find the nearest uh, centroids. Um, it's very sensitive to irrelevant features. So for example, we have all these data points uh, equally, uh, dis equally displayed on our uh, coordinate system. But for example, if you had some data points that are far from the others, that would mean that our classification might go wrong because we don't know to which uh, to which class we should put that. Um, yeah, of course, sometimes there is need for optimal value of K uh, of clusters we are uh, clustering our data into. Um, so here again, not a lot of advices. So we just need to make the de decision by ourselves and just provide that information to our data model. And of course, curse of the dimensionality, which just means if we have not two dimensions, but three, five or 10, our basically uh, errors and our predictions would be less uh, accurate uh, for these algorithms. Um, so yeah, I guess that is it. So uh, basically we've talked already a bit about uh, where it could be applied. Again, it's image segmentation. Uh, we could also apply it to recommendation agents. We talked in Kamin's uh, on in kan and algorithm uh, document clustering. So we could cluster, I don't know, document documents by their similarity. So this document is uh, about, I don't know, some weather. That document is about, I don't know, rain, and those documents might be similar. So with Kamin's, we could basically cluster those documents into one group. Um, so that is all from my side. If you have any general questions on what we've discussed today, I would be glad to answer them. <laughs>